Action. As you recall, what we're trying to do here is keep as much serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine in our brains as possible. And the problem is that we spend it faster than we can replace it. So I'm going to share with you some basic tools as to how not to do that, or at least move in that direction. There's a problem with tools, though. We've got these big issues. We're depressed. Our marriages are falling apart. Our family's messed up. We've got a tough job. And we give you these little tools on how you can have a healthier response to that reality. And it never seems as big as a task. But imagine you had to take a choice between having your appendix taken out by the world's best surgeon out in the middle of the woods with his bare hands versus having a pretty decent surgeon who has a operating room with all of the tools. I think you'd go with the decent surgeon and the tools. Tools are important. And they may seem small, but they make a huge difference. Over the years, I've had people call me and say, well, Dr. Bell, they say, I've tried everything else. And finally, I thought, although your tools sound small and dumb, I'd give them a try. And much to my surprise, they worked. I don't know what they thought I was trying to do, is just pad the time or something in teaching these tools. There was a person I knew who wanted to start a church. He had a little cabin up on the side of a hill, and this property you could not build a church on because it was too steep. And he is starting a little Bible study in his cabin. And God says to him, I want you to dig dirt out of this side of the road and dump it on that side of the road with a wheelbarrow. He figured four or five hundred years, he could probably have a flat enough place to build a church. But he went for it. And he's getting really buff, you know, because the whole month he's been dumping dirt and do it by a half hour a day. All of a sudden, he noticed that the nature of the dirt changed. It became gravel. So just on a hunch, he took a bag down to the local gravel uh, pit and says, is this stuff good gravel? They says, wonderful. Where did you find it? He says, I got a big pile of it in my backyard. So they moved in with their big earth movers, scraped the whole hill off, gave him a flat land and $100,000 to build his church. Sometimes when we do the little we can, and we can't see how on earth is that possibly going to change things, you'd be surprised at how it does make a difference. So the first tool you use when you notice that you are sweating the big stuff. Now, important, just notice. Don't yell at yourself for doing it again. If you go to AA and every Friday night you have this tremendous urge to go drinking, they will tell you for 90 days you have to go to an AA meeting every single day before you can back off a little. Where'd they get that 90 days? That's three months. And scientific research has shown it takes three months to change a good intention into a habit you can count on under stress. I found it takes two and a half months to quit screwing up and then two weeks to reprogram the brain. So we carry this hump in front of us of it takes time to change. And if you notice you're doing it again, which you will, I tell my patients in my partial hospital where they're there for five days, I say, what percentage of my patients go out and repeat the behaviors that got them here in the first place? The answer is 100%. It's going to be three months before they will consistently catch themselves and do it in a new way. So you notice, and you notice without yelling at yourself. Just, yep, I'm doing it again. And then you ask this very important question. Maybe I'm simplistic. I like to boil things down and make them straightforward. I believe this is the most important skill in mental health, to notice when you are wasting your energy and your neurotransmitters and ask this in question. Is it my job right now to do something about whatever you're circling on. You remember when information comes in, it's thrown into the limbic system and goes round and round. And when you realize you're doing that again, you say, 
am I supposed... Now, you've got to have the right question. There are two questions. What am I supposed to do and what am I supposed to do? That sounds like the same question, but it's how we ask it that's crucial. If you're fussing with something and you've done what you can about it, you ask yourself, so what am I supposed to do? And the answer is nothing. Now, if you need to do something next week, then figure out how you're going to remember or your brain will not quit fussing with it and then let it go. If it's not your job, but you could do something about it, don't. You wear yourself out and you make the other person too dependent. Now I'm getting older and I've had a lot of experience and I've had to set limits on some people I really love. And I thought, well, you know, I'm a psychiatrist. I've got tools, I've got skills. I, I should be able to help these people. But there's an old joke, not that funny, but it makes a point. How many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? The answer is one, if the light bulb wants to be changed. And if you're trying to change somebody that won't do their part and they don't really want to change, you're just going to spin your wheels and burn out, let it go. Now what if it's big and it's bad and it's unfair and you don't like it and it's dangerous? What if in fact everybody on the planet is going to die unless somebody does something? And still, what are you supposed to do about it? There was a book written a few years ago, I believe it was called On the Beach. And what had happened in this book, supposedly the U.S. and Russia had, had a big, dirty nuclear war, and this cloud of killer gas was circling the planet. Everybody from the North Pole to halfway south of the equator was already dead. It was spreading out, and the people in New Zealand had six months left before the last living being in the universe would be extinguished. What do you do with such a horrible thing? Well, some of them went to work and pretended that Nothing was wrong and made widgets for humans that wouldn't exist. Some just killed themselves because they didn't want to wait for the gas cloud to come and do it. Some lived wild. Some people got drunk. The smart people moved to the beach. In my opinion, they were the wise ones and made the best of the last six months of human existence. I use that story so that I look at a problem and I say, compared to the last human being is going to be extinguished, how bad is my problem? So far, I haven't run into any quite that bad. And if it's reasonable for them to focus on, what can I do? And you notice I underlined that because I believe that's the most important word here. Now, there's a companion question. What can I do? So we pull our mind away from what we can't do because this simply gives your brain permission to quit fussing. If you recall my previous talk, the brain believes that going round and round will get you to come up with a solution you haven't figured out. It won't, but you've got to give it permission to quit by saying, look, if there's nothing I can do, it's all right to drop it. But then you have to refocus. In Ecclesiastes 9, a book that sounds a bit negative, basically Ecclesiastes says, hey, get the big picture. You're just going to die and rot, and ain't nobody going to remember you. Now, if you disagree with that... Uh, your great, 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 great grandfather, what was his name? Um, what did he worry about? What were his hopes and dreams? You don't know? Why don't you ask his friends? Well, they're all dead and gone. We can't ask them, right? Doesn't mean that their lives didn't count. It doesn't mean that the things they were concerned about weren't important. It's just saying nothing is worth vexing your spirit and getting yourself upset about. It goes on. Pull your mind away from what you don't have to what you do. It says, do you have food? Slow down. Taste it. Appreciate that you have it. Appreciate the people that fixed it for you. Savor it. Do you have something to drink? Slow down. Taste it. Savor it. Appreciate that you have it. Do you have decent clothes? Put them on. Wear them well. Appreciate that you have it. Then it says, pour oil on your head. Reminds me of when I was a kid, we used to use brill cream. They used to call it greasy kid stuff, keep our hair in place. I don't know. Anyways, they poured oil in their heads in those days. I don't think they took baths. They used to have this oil that had good smelling perfume in it. So it's basically, what do you have? Grab a hold of that and enjoy. It's imperfect. It's maybe not what you want. I mean, we live in a whole civilization that says, if you want to be happy, get more. Yeah, right. No. Appreciate what you do have. Now, it says, look around you. Are there people in your life? Then live with them with joy 
and love on them and invest in the relationship. It's important to get these priorities straight, that we do not turn people into projects or make them less important than our projects or make the things that we have. It's people that are the center. So you refocus on what do I have? Who is in my life? Now, if this person wants to grow and change and ask you to help, by all means. If they're horribly messed up, set some limits on them, but never try to fix them. It will wear you out and they will just resist. I swear most people, if you tell them to breathe, would hold their breath until they passed out. I mean, we're all that way. You're not going to get anywhere trying to fix the people. I think we turn people into, you know, you, you watch on the TV, there are all these people get old house that's all beat up and they, they calculate, you know, uh, if I buy it for this much and put this much in, then I'll have a house I can sell for. The, you know, we've we got these fixer upper people. No, it doesn't work. The next thing we need to do is say, let me erase this, or at least move it up. How do we make it go left? Move what? I want to write, and this is too low down. Okay. Um, do you want to just do a new screen, or yeah. do you want me to? Okay. Uh, there we go. Okay. Then. And then you can move it back if you want to look at that stuff too. Who? Who? That's. Oh, the <laughs> keep looking. <laughs> All habits die hard. What can I do? So to review, what do I have? Enjoy it, savor it, appreciate it. Who is in my life? Invest in them, love on them and receive a relationship. It says, what can you do? Do it with all your might. And then it pauses and says, but don't forget, you're just going to die in rotten and nobody's going to remember you. So don't get all uptight. So it wants us to live life with enthusiasm and energy, but without getting tense. So how can we be calm and caring at the same time? How can we be peaceful and passionate? How can we do with all our might and then drop it? That's what we have to learn by pulling yourself focused back. If you recall, I mentioned that when you take your mind away from the round and rounds that lead nowhere and get back into the here and now and do what you can, there's another part of you keeps working on the problem and will often come up with a solution you would never see if you kept fussing with it. Trust that part of you and let it go. The next thing, that if you recall, I said that we waste our energy by using negatives to motivate. We use names, we put ourselves down, we use rules that are unreasonable, we compare with others, we try to get ourselves going through fear of what the future will look like rather than do what we can in the present. So again, oops. your first job is just to notice when you are using shame to motivate. No shame. You can say I screwed up, but not I am a screw up. It's different. You notice and you don't shame yourself for shaming yourself. Well, you probably will. That's one. Uh, so often over the years, the person has identified some patterns they want to change. They know I know those patterns. They're in a session. They're trying not to repeat those patterns. And in the very effort to not repeat it, they repeat it, and we all just start laughing at the human condition, and that's usually when they start to make some progress. So try not to yell at yourself because you were yelling at yourself, but you notice, and then you have to <coughs> use the following tool. And you ask yourself, have you ever done better through self-contempt or fear? You know, if it worked, I'd hand you out a list 50 cuss words to use three times a day so you could do better. Because then you'd do better. But if I give you that list, you'd call my boss and say, Dr. Bell's a quack. You know, he's giving me a list of names to call myself. 
Well, if it's wrong for me to tell you to do that, maybe it's wrong for you to do that. And then there's also this business of reminding ourselves that it's not logical to say there's one set of rules that apply to you that don't apply to others. Either all of us, including myself, are worthwhile and needed, or none of us are. Now, we all messed up, that's true. We've got things we need to work on, but that is not the source of our worth or our belongingness or the fact that we're needed. So you need to see that logically that means that you are worthwhile and that this makes no sense with the shame. And then um, again, you notice, you tell yourself these truths and you refocus. Now, one of the ways to refocus I'm going to cover in the next tool, which is not sweating the small stuff. So I'm going to combine the two tools a little bit. You refocus on what you have been able to do in the recent past that's positive. So let's go to the next tool. If you recall, when things happen, if you overreact, that wasting a lot of serotonin. You're sweating the small stuff. So we want to give that up. Now, when I ask patients what they've gotten out of counseling, I get this one reply so commonly, it, it, it's just starting to bother me a little. But they're not wrong. They catch themselves overreacting, and they use some tool to calm back down, and they call that a coping skill, and say, well, what do you mean? What do you do? Well, I'll go for a walk, I'll listen to music, I'll journal, I'll do something like that, and it calms me down. But here's my concern, is very often they seem to calm down and then ignore the responsibility that triggered them in the first place. A husband and wife are fighting and, and he's getting all worked up and he says, you better let me walk around the block or I'm just liable to punch something. Why is it she doesn't let him go for a walk? Why do they get into a fight? Because she knows he's going to walk around the block, come home, and ignore the problem. If she knew he'd walk around the block, calm down, and deal with the problem calmly, she'd let him go for the walk. She knows that it's important not just to calm down. Otherwise, just go get a bunch of Valium or alcohol or pot or something and calm down, but then you wouldn't face life. It's calm down and face life. So at the beginning, you notice yourself overreacting. Remember, without yelling at yourself for doing it, you use some tool to calm back down, and then you don't waste all this serotonin in here. You just waste this serotonin back here. So the ultimate goal is to learn to not overreact in the first place. But something has to change if you're going to react in the spur of the moment in a healthy way. Let's say you took a person who finishes high school and he is a valedictorian, so he's smart. He was a quarterback, so he's in good shape. Everybody likes him, so he's got good personality. He joins the army, and they decide, we don't need to waste a lot of money on boot camp. We'll just put him out on the front line. You know, there's a name for those people. They're called cannon fodder, and they die. Why? It's not enough to be intelligent. It's not enough to be coordinated. It's not enough to have a good personality. Something happens to you as you go through boot camp that allows you to make the other guy die for his country rather than you die for your country, which is how you win a war, by the way. And so... What is it has to change and how do we get there? Well, I'm going to give you a tool. First, you need to know that your brain can only analyze about four hours with any kind of accuracy. So at lunch, it's about four hours in the morning, at supper and bedtime, you pause and you give yourself some credit for doing something. And here, the key word is the word picky positive. You see, our brains, for safety reasons, are wired in the picky negative. We automatically see the dangers, the things we don't have, the people that aren't in our life, the picky negatives. But you got to balance with some positives or you won't have any balance. Our young people coming back from Afghanistan, for example, have had to be picky negative. They see some little old lady in a burqa and they have to assume she's got a bomb on her or they won't survive. They come back here and they don't do so well because they continue in this constant jumpy negative. 
You've got to see. We did research that showed if you sleep six hours or less, they gave people a list of 10 positives and 10 negatives and said, tomorrow you get $20, a total of 400 bucks, if they could remember the full list. That's a lot of motivation. The ones who slept six hours or less could only remember the negatives. The ones that got a full night's sleep could also remember the positives. Our brains automatically pick up on the negatives. We have to work at being picky positive. And so, you know, let me erase this. Where you go? Try touching the screen so you know where the cursor is. There you go. Oh, it's, give it a 10 seconds or so. It's glitching again. There you go. Okay. So you look at the morning and you say, what's something I was able to, it's interesting when I ask this at my partial I usually do this talk at noon and they all say well I got out of bed and came into the program didn't I I say okay we'll take that that's a small positive but that's all we're asking for make sure you don't add any negatives because sometimes they'll say well finally I did this or I did that I guess or I did this but no just a small positive and you write it down you I'll let you take a minute right now just to pause and think Okay, what's something you could give yourself credit for? And you'll find maybe it's a little harder than you. It's almost like we feel guilty giving ourselves a little credit. We're not saying we're better than anyone else. We're saying we are capable of doing our part, and it counts. Then we need to see, is there something someone else has done? Maybe for you, maybe not. And give them a little credit. And that then leads to stop and find something about life itself. This is not something anybody did. Remember Ecclesiastes said your food, your clothing, your drink. Uh, also, maybe bird singing or the weather or, or some music or something you learned that was fascinating or, or just something about life to pause and savor. We go rushing through life and we miss these things and there's this big emptiness inside. Now what this does, when a problem arises, there are some basic things you have to remember to not overreact. I'll run down the list, but I'm not expecting you to remember all these, just to realize it's hard and you need a way of building it in if it's going to work. First, you need to look at the problem and remember you're a person who's handled lots of problems in the past. I remember one lady, she had absolutely no sense of competence. So I had to keep a notebook and write every little thing she did all day. I got out of bed, I got dressed, uh, I got breakfast for the kids and made their lunches and sent them off. And I, you know, every little thing she did. It wasn't long till she would come up to new situations and say, you know, I think I can handle this. I am a doer. And you need to remember that doing the little you can counts. It makes a difference. You need to remember that your significance and worth is not connected to doing anything perfectly. That'd be crazy. Nobody's ever done anything perfect on this planet. We just do the best we can. It's worth doing. It's not connected to anyone's opinion of you. It's not even connected to your own opinion of you. You are worthwhile whether you agree or not. So we need to remember that. We need to remember that there are others in this world. Trouble is there's a lot of people we wish would come through for us that don't. But look for the people that are positive and remember that if two people leave homes right next to each other drive through the same traffic to the same job at the same time and the first one says people ought to drive well he's going to get to work tense because people that drive well he's going to take for granted and people who drive badly and say oh those horrible people the one that says watch out you got to drive defensively they get to work and they're not uptight because when they saw people driving badly, they were careful and they said, yeah, that's the way most people. But they also know some people driving well and kind of made their day. So I'm not saying we're Pollyannish and we ignore the fact that there are problems in this world. I'm saying we don't let the problem people bug us so much and we begin to look for and give credit to the decent people around us that are trying and then we're more likely to reach out for them. And then we grab a hold of some piece of life and pause and savor it. If you do this at lunch, 
then you look forward to the next four hours and say, what am I going to be facing? And you prime yourself to appreciate what you're able to do, what other people do, and something to savor in the afternoon. At in the afternoon, you write those down, and you also remind yourself of what you did in the morning. And at supper, you remind yourself of what you did in the afternoon and in the morning. If you review the last couple of times and then look forward to the next, it begins to prime your mind so when you get into problems, you don't overreact in the first place, and then you aren't even wasting this amount of serotonin. What happened there? Oh, it just took a while. Okay. If you recall, the next thing that we do is we procrastinate. This requires output of energy and neurotransmitter to keep us from doing things. Again, you notice, without yelling at yourself, there I am procrastinating again. And you simply look at it and say, when can I do this? Is it something I can never take and do anything about? Or should I do it now? But we need to make up our mind that now is the time. Because putting things off is going to use up your energy. And all that extra energy is wasted. Then, of course, there's the stuffing things. It's pretty natural. We're afraid, some of us terrified, that if we let all our feelings out, we'd blow up, we'd kill somebody, something terrible would happen. Or at the very least, we'd lose our job and our relationships. So this is where counseling can come in, is how do you go ahead and express yourself? How do you accept things? How do you let things go? But we need to notice when we're doing that again without yelling ourselves. And then go ahead and proceed to either let it go or talk to the people. Okay, so let's pause for a while and let me catch my...